Greetings to my fellow Peace Blunderers, and today I'm showing you the coolest, my personal favorite responses to many popular defenses that you get to face as an E4 player. Now, if you're a D4, C4, Knight of 3 player, or any other Bonanza player, I still suggest you to stick around a little bit. Maybe this video will make you want to play E4 just a little bit from time to time. And yeah, for people who watch my streams, those who see me on the regular, for them, a lot of what I'm going to show will hardly be a surprise, but some of it might. Also on that note, let me remind you to follow me on Twitch. I would really love to interact with you guys some more outside of YouTube. Now without further ado, let's start with the holy grail of E4 defenses, E4, E5. A very traditional way of responding to E4 and now there are plenty of moves that are playable. You can play D4, Knight of 3, Knight C3, but you know, as some of you know, I'm quite a crazy person. My recommendation against e5 is actually f4 the king's gambit now wait a second before you say anything else king's gambit is not as bad as many people want you to believe yes king's gambit is not something that you should really play if you are above 2500 in a high level tournament but how many bloody hell are you that are above 2500 watching this video i don't think there are many king's gambit is active it's surprising and it creates a wonderful position where you get to show all of your chess mastery and blow your opponent off the board so what's the idea behind the king's Gambit. well we expect them to take and now we play knight of three we want to go for rapid development bishop c4 is also a move but i do not recommend it it's much weaker we want to play knight of three not only because we want to develop a piece but we also prevent the queen h4 check which in many many king's gambit positions is quite an annoying move now let me show you how a typical king's gambit position can unfold the most traditional way of playing it for black is to play g5 to protect f4 and trying to hold on to it and now as white, we strike h4, we're trying to undermine g5, hence undermining f4 in the process. g4, trying to push the pawn forward and kick the knight away, the knight goes to e5. And the line I'm about to show you now will drive you absolutely crazy. It is main line theory, and you're gonna love it, okay? Knight f6, knight f6 is not the only move possible, there are like 5 or 6 moves that black can play after knight e5 from white, but this is probably the best one and one of the most popular ones. It attacks the e4 pawn and asks us what are we going to do? Well, the best response is going to be knight takes g4, remember that the knight is not hanging because the queen is now defending it, knight takes e4, right trying to counter attack in the center and black has regained the extra pawn d3 asking questions of the knight and now any other knight move than the, the one i'm about to show you is going to be better for white already or even winning the best move is knight g3 which honestly is a move that most of you would play because it looks very active and it attacks the rook on h1 however it is about time that we show you some fireworks. We ignore the hanging rook and we play bishop takes f4, wow. Knight takes h1, well, obviously most of you would take the rook there. Queen e2 check, and now queen e7, blocking the check. Bishop e7 is a terrible blunder because it hangs mate in two after knight f6 check. Bishop is pinned, cannot capture, the only legal move is king f8 and now we deliver the mate with bishop h6 and we win so bishop e7 blocking is not possible we block with the queen all right now we play knight f6 check just as we did in the last variation where it was mate in two the only legal move is king d8 and now it works again bishop takes c7 check this is a diversion the king is forced to take the bishop and the queen, as you can probably see now, will be prone to the fork after knight d5 check, forking king and queen. King d8, knight takes queen, and believe it or not, here, after bishop takes the knight back and queen f3, the position is equal. The position is equal. Black has got one point more in material and there are all sorts of imbalances happening. The position is equal after bishop takes h4 and now black is an exchange up, I believe. 
Well, not an exchange up, they're just two points in material. Now we play king d2, and this is where I'm going to stop. So black has two points up in material, however, we have more development. This knight could be at some point vulnerable, although it may just get out because of the support of the bishop, but it remains to be seen. And yeah, this is just an awesome position to play. The engine says it's all zeros, but of course black will have to be handling it with very much more care than white. It's much easier here for white to play this position. Now coming back to our original position where we played knight f3 on move 3, black of course isn't always going to play g5 as the most principled move because not everyone is going to know what to do against the king's gambit. A lot of possible moves are here like knight f6, d6, knight c6 and honestly they all allow for very interesting gameplay. In the positions where black allows you to recapture the pawn on f4 for free, you should be very happy. This is something that black should not be doing, but a lot of people just not knowing what to do, they allow you to do that. For example, d6, right? We play d4, bishop c4 is also possible. And then they play something like, um, I don't know, they play knight f6, right? We get to play knight c3, they get to play bishop e7, they just basically don't care about that pawn, and we get to recapture it, right, for free. And look at this, why wouldn't you take this position? According to the engine, it's almost plus one for white, right? This is just an amazing position. We've got a lot of central control, and yes, black made a couple of inaccuracies, but this is what you expect black to make in many situations. Very few people know King's Gambit theory. Thus, very often you will be getting these wonderful positions when after castles, you play something like bishop c4, and then knight c6, and new castle, and look at this. This is just pure beauty. The strength of this position comes from amazing central control, as I just showed you, and also the open file, well, the semi-open file that your f rook has got. At some point, you need to tuck away your king to h1, and in many king's gambit positions, you've got to do that just to avoid any trouble along the c5, g1 diagonal, but this is, you know, this is by the by. This is your bread and butter. Central control, semi-open f file, king side attack, Let's go. And this is why you play King's Gambit. You play it for fun. You play it to win. And if you think that King's Gambit is suspicious, think about how many games Morphe in the 19th century won with King's Gambit. And if you don't like the 19th century, if you think that players were very suspicious, and they kind of were at the time, think about Boris Spassky. Think about one of the world champions, one of the best players ever, in my top 10 of all time, actually, a very underrated player. He played the King's Gambit in the 60s, in the 70s, at the highest level, and scored some amazing wins. This opening should never be disrespected. Study it, play it, have fun with it. My recommendation on move two against e5, you play f4, and you ask some really difficult questions for black. One small side note, a lot of people actually in this position, they decline the gambit, and this is not a good move already. For example, a lot of people play king's gambit decline with knight c6, and we should just respond with knight f3, as we would had the pawn been captured, and sort of play a king's gambity like position when they don't capture a pawn on f4, and we don't capture back just yet. We just sort of wait. d6 is possible, bishop b2, for example, knight f6. We're going to achieve a slightly symmetrical position after castle, bishop b7, d3, castle, Knight c3, and this is an alright position, in my opinion. This is an alright position, white is slightly better. And, you know, at some point, you may want to either push or take here, it depends. And then you get, again, a very decent center and a semi open f file. You've got to learn how to attack along the semi open f file, and you will get a lot of nice wins here. You again get to launch a kingside slaughter at some point in the position. Okay, number two, the second most popular response to e4, from beginner to intermediate level, slightly advanced as well, c5, the Sicilian, and we have another gambit in store for you, d4, check out my Smith Mora. 
going to be there or there. Check out my Smith Mora video as well that I filmed some time ago. It's a brilliant way to get blacks out of opening preparation and make sure that you'll have a very fun game. Now the point of the Smith Mora is that you sacrifice a pawn as you do in many gambits and then you play c3 takes takes and here a lot of different positions are of course possible. I'm just going to show you the essential Smith Mora and why you want to play this. Knight c6, knight f3, d6, bishop c4. It's very important to memorize this piece setup for white. You may want to replicate in the majority of your Smith Mora positions, right? Of course, you've got to still adapt to what black does, but still, in most positions, this will be your desired setup that I'm about to show you. e6, castles, knight f6, queen e2, bishop b7, rook d1 coming closer to the point and now castling would be a mistake this is something that you should go back to my video on the smith mora here black should really play e5 to prevent any sorts of tricks bishop b3 castles now rook c1 and then something like maybe bishop e6 is probably the best move for black and this is the setup that we really want our pieces are absolutely perfect our rooks are amazing and as long as your d1 rook is opposing the queen on d8 you will always have possible tricks with taking on e5 for example now you don't take because the pawn doesn't have to take the knight will so this trick doesn't work right now but it may in the future when the knight leaves the c6 square and despite us being a pawn down the engine is saying that this position is absolutely equal and when we have an equal position, the question is, would you rather take white or black? Well, it depends on your taste. If you just want to play defensive and you enjoy having extra material and holding on to it and trying to prove that white is being a bit too reckless. If you prefer black, that's fine. But of course, I would take white here any day. We have great open C files and semi-open D files to play with. Amazing pieces and amazing opportunity. Study the Smith Mora. Study the replies that Black could throw at you and how you should reply to them and have fun yet again. Coming at number three, we've got the French. Actually, I don't have a very good score against the French. Probably French is the defense that I struggle the most with, but not because of my opening choice, not in any way imaginable. It's just that because I mostly struggle in late middle game, end game kind of territory, according to what I'm gathering. So the French, e4, e6, and now we play traditionally with d4, of course. They reply with d5, and now again, some variations are possible. You could play the advanced French. You could play like the standard normal variation with knight c3. However, my recommendation, strong recommendation, is knight d2 going for the tar rush. The tar rush has a lot of good things going for it. Let me show you a position that arises most frequently after the tar rush. Black here can play knight f6. They can play c5 and they can take. Right, three options are the most popular options, and they offer different outcomes. But the most popular is going to be knight f6. Now e5, going to a quasi advanced French, if you will, knight f to d7. And now we play bishop d3. We want to get the bishop pound before the knight for a reason I'm about to show. c5, the main point of the French trying to attack in the center, c3. And this is awesome, by the way. The fact that we got our knight to d2, right, and not on c3, now allows us to defend the d4 pawn with the pawn. Now knight c6, knight e2, trying to support the pawn a little bit more, but we are doing it with knight to e2, not knight f3. Again, I'm about to show you why. Takes, takes, queen b6 is usually played. And now this knight, the d2 knight, is the one that goes to f3. Bishop before check, bishop d2 blocking, takes, takes, castles, castles, and now f6. One of the main ideas in the French, you want to undermine the white's central structure of d4, e5 with f6. We take, takes with knight, 
we play h3 so we get rid of the possible threats on g4 from the knight or maybe at some point the bishop bishop d7 and our e2 knight finally can go to g3 and that was the point track the adventure of our knights this knight went from there to there and this knight went from there to there and this is the point of the tarash your knights end up on f3 and g3 where they are perfectly poised for a kingside attack and don't forget our other pieces are also great we need to still figure out what to do about our rooks usually they go to like e1 c1 and white is according to the engine almost plus one white is significantly better yes tarash does seem a bit tame at first you play instead of knight c3 knight f3 you play knight d2 knight e2 it seems like a little compact and passive but then you get to place your knights on perfect squares perfectly placed for a good attack very active and who wouldn't take this position as white here i think very few people would honestly number four the dreaded karakan yes a lot of people hate playing against the karakan but you know it's not surprising why Karakhan seems to be this rock solid opening that it's very hard to break down and people just don't really like when the opponent's defense does not get broken down easily. However, I'm going to show you a very active option that you can have in your arsenal to make Karakhan a little bit shaky. All right, e4, c6, d4, d5, the most principled first two moves and now three main moves are possible for white e5 going for the advance knight c3 going for the normal and takes on d5 going for the exchange there is of course an odd opening like f3 going for the so-called fantasy variation which gotham chess seems to like a lot but we can leave the subpar openings to levy okay we play the best stuff here we go into the panov botvinik attack starting with the exchange d5 takes on d5 and now c4 striking at the black's central pawn immediately from the flank and now again a lot of theoretical moves one of the main lines is going to be knight of six very logical moves from now on honestly knight c3 knight c6 putting the knights in the center knight f3 we have all the four knights perfectly placed bishop g4 pinning the knight so that the support of the d4 pawn is slightly compromised but we get to support the d4 pawn some more with bishop e3 e6 trying to get space for the dark squared bishop to get it out of course and now we play the crucial c5 sometimes you don't get to play c5 in a pan of botanic attack but when you do it's usually very good it grabs space on the queen side and usually you want to use that queen side majority look we have two pawns here for black and we have three pawns here for white which means that our plan in the game is going to be long term to try and create a solid strong passed pawn and let that passed pawn win you the game now going back to this position remember that almost every time your opponent captures here on c4 and you get to take with your bishop from f1 like this it's usually very good you develop your bishop for free while your opponent just got rid of his own central pawn however i want to warn you that the more experienced players will not be capturing on c4 without a very good reason but if they do you should be happy for that same reason i don't recommend developing your bishop to e2 or d3 while your pawn is still on c4 and let me show you why in this position if we play bishop e2 for example right they can now capture on c4 and we recapture with a bishop and we just sort of wasted a tempo if you see what i mean our bishop did something in two moves what it could have done in just one so you either play c5 and then develop your bishop or maybe in some position you want to capture cd and then also develop your bishop or you wait for the opponent to capture dc and then you recapture with bishop takes c4 and you're golden either way now coming back to this position something like bishop takes f3 is possible queen takes f3 and white has got more space white is slightly more developed and as i showed you earlier white has got a very clear plan of pushing his queenside pawns maybe creating a passport and winning 
very easy plan to follow, very easy to grasp and understand. This is why I recommend the plan of it's not as boring, not as closed, not as unclear as other Karakan variations. Just learn it, play it, see how it feels and master it, win games easy. Number five, the Scandinavian E4 D5. Ooh. First of all, watch my Scandinavian videos. I've got two on the main line, Queen A5, and on Queen D6, Gubinski melts defense. These are very good videos to understand some basic plans for white and black. Queen d8, I haven't made just yet. It's still soft in the background. I will get to it eventually. However, let me show you at least in this video what to do against the most popular queen a5. Of course, we want to take. Queen takes, knight c3, nothing fancy, nothing new. Queen a5, and now d4, the best move. Knight f6. Knight f3, and remember that every time they pin your knight, this is a very popular move that I've seen. Every time they pin the knight with the bishop on move 4 with bishop g4, it's already an inaccuracy. When you play g3, uh, whether they take or go back, the position is already much better for white. You should look into the lines the engine is offering you after that and you know learn them and play them the principal move in this position is bishop f5 and this is now the idea that i want you to memorize against the scandinavian main line knight e5 this is a very important move and it will enable us to do a lot of nasty stuff later on let's see c6 bishop c4 very natural e6 also quite natural blocking the c4 f7 diagonal and making space for your dark squared bishop to come out at some point somewhere. And now, because of the knight on a5, very crucial moment, we play g4. Yes, we play the king side pawn pushes. And now bishop g6, h4, even more active. And now this bishop will be in trouble, the bishop on g6. Knight bd7, takes, takes. And now h5, going even more aggro. The bishop e4, remember that the knight is pinned, so the bishop is safe for now. And now, crazily enough, we castle kingside. Our king is surprisingly safe there. And we've already advanced a bunch of our pawns. We're going to play f4 at some point as well. And we're getting a very active, a very interesting position where white is definitely better due to his superior development. The engine is showing that it's almost plus one cannot refuse such a position if you want to play for a win. Just remember the crucial idea of knight e5 supported by d4, right? The knight needs a square to safely stand on, which is usually supported by d4, and then subsequent pushes on g4 and h4. This is a very nice idea to utilize. Sometimes uh, you want to castle queenside as white. This is also possible. You play bishop d2, queen e2, and you castle queenside. Just remember this key idea, which works very efficiently against many, many, many Scandinavians, not just this one. It's amazing to play, and it always, almost always gives white a superior hand. And our final defenses for today, number six and number seven, are going to be very similar, Pierce and Modern. I play in very similar ways against both of them, so it's very easy for me to explain. Generally speaking, in a lot of these flank defense positions, I have a very simple principle that I almost exclusively adhere to, is play f4. f4 is usually a great move for empowering your center. When the opponent is allowing you to take the center, I prefer to take it and just take the game to them. So let's start with the Pierce. E4, D6, D4, Knight of 6. I'm going to follow one of the main lines. Now, Knight C3, G6, the point of the pits, you want to avoid putting your stuff into the center. You want to put it on the flank. You want to think it to your bishop. So now we play F4, as I advertised, the so called Austrian attack. Remember that name. Bishop G7, Knight F3, castles a Bishop D3. Usually you want to put your bishops against the modern and appears on d3 and e3 to compound your center a little bit more because these bishops are very good at defending your central pawns that are about to be attacked very ruthlessly. Knight c6, castles king side, and now again some other moves are possible, but I'm gonna go with the main line that I think you should like. e5, d5, 
we are responding with the opponent's advance with our own advance. Knight g4 takes, takes, knight takes. We get an extra pawn, but very temporarily. Please follow me there for some tactical tricks, which are about to fire away with knight takes e4. They took a pawn back and our knight has attacked. So knight takes, bishop takes, the material is equal again. And after we play something like c3, kicking the d4 knight away to f5, we have this position. And this is where I'm going to stop. I think this is a very nice position. As you can tell, I'm a player who really enjoys a semi-open f file, which you can use very, very efficiently to attack the opponent's king side. Don't forget that they also can have some very major dark square weaknesses if that bishop is ever gone. White here is slightly better. You tuck away your king as well to h1 and you attack, 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 attack. It seems like all of your pieces are staring at the king side very nicely. This is why you've got to attack on the king's side, most likely. And let me go over the peers. The peers will have a similar idea in slightly different execution, but still a similar idea. e4, d6, d4, and now g6. That's a slight difference between the modern and the peers. We don't play knight f6 in the modern, at least immediately. So knight c3, bishop g7, and then f4 again. This is now called the pseudo Austrian attack. It's called so because it does resemble the real Austrian attack in the Pierce. It has the same motive of f4, but it's a different opening. So we can't really call it an Austrian attack here as well. We call it a pseudo Austrian attack. Still the same thing, more or less. And now you honestly may as well expect transposing into the Pierce with knight f3 on move 4 and this is now the exact same position i was showing you just a while ago however also you may as well face the continuation of the modern with knight c6 and now we play the bishop b3 move again as i was recommending we might want to play bishops on d3 and e3 because this pawn has attacked twice now with knight c6 and uh, bishop g7 so we want to support it twice again uh one of the best ways to do that is with the bishop and now knight f6 knight f3 castles and then again a lot of moves are possible but the one that gives us the most advantage is e5 trying to push the pawn in the center because the opponent did not play e5 as they did in the period just a while ago sometimes we want to play it ourselves knight goes back to d7 and white here is plus one more or less white enjoys a very nice central advantage if you like having a lot of space in the center and just blow your opponent away this is the position that you will be very much interested in some of the following ideas well you can castle either way honestly you want to start pushing h4 h5 at some point because the knight is not there to support the h5 square and you want to destroy that feet and catch the structure you want to bust up with the king side you want to have on attack and win so yeah this is where i'm going to stop i think seven defenses is enough for one video all the alakines and Nemzovic's and always defenses and whatnot will be put separately in some later video let's just stop here for now so if you just so happened to find this video useful please like and subscribe follow me on twitch i stream wednesdays fridays sundays Find me on chess.com, join our Discord, all that good stuff. And let me know in the comments what you thought of this video, if you want to have more of this kind. And as always, I will see you very, very soon. My favorite unintentional gambiteers. Love you all. See you in the next one.